Good morning uh, and welcome to this session. I think the most exciting and interesting session for the day. Politics is always in all our bloods and politics is often the talk uh, of the evening, tetare stalls, uh, conversations, friendly and in anger or in frustration, in hope. So all added together, politics uh, makes Malaysia more exciting. Don't you think so? Okay. Now, this session, and you have the program before you, and you have the CV of all the speakers, we have a very distinguished panel, but we are asking a simple question. Two years after GE14, what's next? Two years after GE14, what's next? So, it's between the political promises and the realities on the ground whether at the high places at parliament or cabinet or Putrajaya on one hand, and on the issues of ordinary, everyday people on the ground. What are their aspirations? What are their struggles? What are their frustrations? I've got some five basic questions, and I think the panelists, some would just respond. Uh, others maybe have prepared text, so I leave it to them. But I think there is a timekeeper that controls the time of this session uh, into lunchtime. Is pH divided on the top and ineffective on the ground? You have uh, at least two key leaders of the pH sitting on either end of this panel, not saying one is on the right and one is on the left of the political divide within pH but uh, the seating arrangement was not mine, uh, the organizers. Huh? Secondly, is BN really gaining popular support with PAS? Are they making a strife in politics? Are they dividing the nation further? Have they brought race, religion, and hatred? Or are they really forging uh, unity of some kind? Are they showing promises that they will capture the next round. So over the next two years, what would they do? What is the impact on economic, ethnic relations on day-to-day -day lives of ordinary people? So we are looking at increased polarization, increased politicization, but at the same time, our index, peace index, global peace index, seem quite high. So the contradictions of light. What's happened to the reform agenda, uh, is it back to politics as usual? Uh, is it the end of hope? Is there possibilities for the future? Would we see the change? Would the change come over the next two years, whether politics, social reform, institutional reform at all levels? We have a distinguished panel Mostly politicians, but at least two of us are non-politicians on the platform. Um, and five, uh, five uh, panelists, uh, political party officials, MPs, from both sides of the political divide. And I think they would share frankly and openly to their thoughts and reflections. I think they put the women on one side and the men on another, but... Uh, uh, this is a bipartisan sort of discussion. But um, I, I think YB Maria Chin Abdullah needs no introduction. She played a major role uh, in Brise, and Brise is known uh, for the largest people's movement on the ground on a very specific area uh, on uh, electoral reform, um, mobilizing large numbers of people of all ethnic communities, which uh, brought about major changes, and she herself is the MP of Pataling Jaya. Uh, many of us have had very good opportunities to work with her, and currently she is the chair of a new group, which is called All Party Parliamentary Reform, set up by Parliament on a bipartisan way to look at sustainable development goals. Can we give a hand to YB to share her views and reflections at this time? Thank you. 
morning. Assalamu alaikum, Dana. Salam sejahtera. Thank you very much for giving me this uh, opportunity. Um, I just want to start with a, a bit of uh, sharing. This morning, I just received news that um, the Mama Berset chair, uh, Andre uh, Kang, has just passed away. Um, and I think that, you know, over yes, last year and this year, uh, Berset has lost two leaders. Um, the other one was On Lyman, who was also the Berset uh, committee member together with me. And their passing on actually reminds me that uh, the reason why we are here with the new government is because of all the sacrifices made by all these people. And so therefore, I owe it to them to actually um, do the right thing. Yeah. So a lot of people say that you know, um, the economic uh, progress is very important because we have to resolve the issue of poverty. Um, that we have to actually base it on uh, need space, uh, all that, yes, I do agree. But at the same time, even if we have economic growth and we do not deal with uh, race, uh, the racial politics and the extremist politics that exist, even worse in, uh, in the years that I have never seen ever before, we have to deal with these uh, issues together. Race politics, extremist politics, together with poverty, have to be dealt together. And it can't be separate. It can't be a trickle-down effect where you get the policy, economic policy right, and so therefore, you know, um, you get the citizens happy. Um, it's not like that in Malaysia. And, and, it, and I feel that, you know, um, it's about time that we really have to, this government has a commitment and it must see through this commitment. We did say yeah, at the beginning of uh, when we came in as a government that we will actually set up the National Harmony and Reconciliation Bill and also a commission. Uh, in fact, even uh, an act on racial against racial hatred and so forth, we didn't do it. It's about time we actually do it, to actually deal with what has actually uh, becoming a poison and also will actually cost us this nation. Um, that is the commitment and I hope that you know, the government will actually um, deal with it because every single issue is now being turned into a race issue. So it has actually blocked some of the economic progress that we have made, some of the social, social uh, political progress that the government has made. And I hope that, you know, it is not just about uh, the government and the opposition, but everyone has to make an effort to stop this kind of racial politics. The other one is that uh, we have to set the narrative that we want unity, we want harmony. But we also need to make sure that we make it come true. And that is what the uh, Pakatan Manifesto was all about. We wanted, we were brought in not to please everyone, not to actually backtrack when there is a protest. We are brought in to do a task. We are brought in because we wanted change. We wanted not to have a corrupt, a system that is built on patronage. We do not want a system that is actually built on um, privileges, abuse of power. We were brought in to do a task to actually get rid of this and set up a system where even if a new government were to come in, it will still be a system that the new government, the next government, cannot change anymore. We want progress and we want a change, a quality change, and that is the task. So when we come in, it is not to please anybody, it is not to maintain our own cushy political position. It is actually to do a very difficult task to set right 61 years of exploitation. That is the task of the Pakatan Harapan government. And we have to really make sure that we do it. 
And so therefore, I really want to see some of these things happening. When um, my friend uh, Terence Gomez, I, actually today he's very mild, I told him that, uh, <laughs> talked about um, the problems that are facing. Um, the shared prosperity sounds nice. But I think that we really f- must make sure that the shared prosperity cannot be any more based on the new economic policy. It cannot be race-based policies. It has to be needs-based, and it means that there are a few things that we need to do to move away from, first, this divide of Bumiputra and non-Bumiputra policies. It has to be based on who needs the most support and how wealth can be distributed in a fair and just manner. So it means tackling yeah, very uh, sensitive issues like the GLCs. It means actually setting up a political financing act to ensure that you know we are moving in the right direction in terms of transparency, in terms of wealth distribution, and in terms of making sure our economic policy reaches those who need it. We talk about social protection. We have a lot of schemes. The new government has introduced lots and lots of schemes to help in terms of transport, health, um, uh, income, single mothers and all that. But let us question. Take a step back. Are they reaching those who really need this kind of schemes? We, We really need to be very bold and be very critical of ourselves and be honest and transparent to say that, you know, we haven't done it very well. Make sure that in the next two to three years, our implementation is sharp and bold. The other one is really uh, Pakatan Harapan government has promised an institutional reform. Uh, we do need the kind of uh, structural reform so that we set a system that is accountable. That is the kind of system that we were voted in, that the people actually hope to see. But we have actually backtracked on a lot of issues. Yeah? When ISAT broke out, we, we backed down. When uh, Rome statue came out, we backed down again. Not, knowing, not being able to actually translate and explain to the public why we need ICERT and why we need Rome Statute. We can't do that anymore. We have to be very firm with the direction that we want and what kind of country we want this to be. So the institutional reform, we really need to set up a very resilient one based on good governance, um, anti-corruption, and transparency. And... um, and really, particularly, not retaining laws that are abusive, that re- nor retaining laws that allows for detention without trial. SOSMA is definitely one of them. We are actually amending. Uh, yes, I agree. Pakatan Harapan Manifesto says to amend the provisions. But really, um, let us talk from the heart. We don't need SOSMA. We don't need laws that allows for possible abuse. So the best thing and the right thing to do is really to abolish this and look at alternative laws, look at existing laws that will actually help to resolve our national security. It is important. We don't have enough, we have enough laws to deal with national security. The IPCMC, when it's now raised that we want to introduce IPCMC, it's either seen we are being accused of um, it's it's a race issue or that it's uh, anti-PDRM without actually looking at IPCMC as something strengthening our police force and looking into the welfare which has been neglected for many, many years. Look at the barracks of the police. You can pass by any police barracks. You will know that they have been neglected. That is what we are set up for, to deal with these kind of issues, to bring in a much more professional, a professional team of 
police officers that will be able to give us the security, the safety that people need. Yeah. So I, I feel that you know we really need to look into the institutional reform, look at the Pakatan Harapan Manifesto, what is it that we can do in the short term, what is it that we can do in the long term, and communicate this with the people. Our communication is pretty, good, uh, pretty bad and poor, and we are not getting the message through. The policies that we want to see happening is not reaching the right people, and um, the data, the data available is really quite poor. We need data, and as has been uh, uh, mentioned by one of the speakers, we need the data not to actually um, criticize the government, but to actually set up policies that are right for this country. That is why we need transparent data, we need to be able to have disaggregated data so that we can make good policies and we can also make good laws. And we can also be able to tell whether our economy is going in the right direction rather than some of the data that is so bad data that we can't make any um, sound analysis of what is happening at the present moment. So, with this, I really hope that you know uh, we will be able to move forward, but um, the government has to do the bold thing. It has to actually um, not be afraid, but to do the right thing and to also set the direction. Where are we going and in the next few years and in the long term so that people will be able to react and will be able to... Um, support what are the policies. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, YB Maria Chin, for that uh, frank and open uh, presentation uh, or reflections, acknowledging the weaknesses and failure, but uh, reaffirming the promises and the aspirations that the PH had and reminding as a backbencher the government its right course uh, of action, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would have questions uh, in the subsequent time uh, to look at uh, how this can improve over the next two, three uh, years, uh, but also to analyze why uh, some of these uh, could not be implemented over the short term as well. Our next speaker is also no stranger to the political scene. YB Datusri Haja Nancy Shukri, a member of parliament from Sarawak uh, and has been a former minister. Uh, you have a long uh, CV write-up of her. Uh, she is currently also, I think the CV doesn't highlight that, with uh, YB Maria Chen, the deputy of the all-party parliamentary group on sustainable development goals, a bipartisan initiative uh, of the current Speaker of Parliament. Over to you, YB. Uh, she would share from a Sarawak perspective uh, and also from a non-PH um, uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you, um, our moderator, Professor Dato Dr. Danson. And um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And still morning now, so a very good morning. Thank you for having me here, and I think it's not too late to wish everyone a very happy new year. And uh, today, actually, when I was outside, somebody asked me whether I'm going to talk about economics. I'm not an economy expert. I'm a, I'm a politician. But um, in order to see the economy to grow, we need good policies. We need to address issues that have been spoken about in the country. I think our moderator mentioned that, and even Maria also mentioned that on race, on, um, on issues that people have been um, questioning about out there. And uh, we heard uh, to um, Denison, um, to, uh, Edmund Terence was mentioning about the policies. All these, either it hurts or um, it favors certain people, we do not know. 
Because some people may be very happy with the policies. But wait till you're Sarawakian. Then you know whether you're going to be very happy after the election. Especially people like us, we were hopeful about a lot of things. And um, especially on the manifesto, perhaps many people who are not from Sarawak may not pay a lot of attention on what the manifesto was all about. And also um, on the promises made to Sarawakians. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, if we do not address matters that have been promised about and matters that touch a lot of the hearts of the people, it is going to hurt a lot of us. And um, I'm glad somebody mentioned my name as if I'm going to use this station as an ammunition. No, I guarantee you that I'm not going to do that because I'm a professional myself. I want to see Malaysia grow, and I want to see Malaysia as a place that we have always been proud of. We have always said that Mal Malaysia is a very is a um, multiracial, multi-religious, and uh, we are very peaceful. And I'd like to stay. I, I like to maintain. Thank you. Maintain Malaysia as a very peaceful and harmonious country. And of course, today I'm, I'm speaking as a Sarawakian. Not representing the government, but I'm here as a Sarawakian and share with you what it is like post GE14. After the result that came out, I stepped back and I want to see what's going to happen because all this that happened, we'll never know. It could be what the Almighty wants to happen and see uh, how we are going to react to it. And I'm glad it was accepted by, by the nation. And it was a peaceful, um, a peaceful transfer of um, government. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, but there's one thing that we need to look into. That is the most crucial issue. The most crucial issue that we're talking about is on unity. I'd like to focus on that because, as I said, if we do not address this, Therefore, you can talk a lot, of th a lot of things about good policies for Malaysia, good things for Malaysia, as you believe, but we can never hide the fact that in the coffee shops, in a lot of places, people have been very, very, very bitter about a lot of things, especially on racial issues. So this is, to me, a very critical thing which to me the most urgent task today for all Malaysians, irrespective of your race, your religion, and your political affiliation. It is to ensure racial and religious harmony, to ensure Malaysians' survival and success as a multiracial and multireligious nation. And it is our responsibility. I think Maria also mentioned that it is everyone's responsibility to ensure that Malaysians' survival and success as a multiracial religious nation depends so much on all of us. So, what we are witnessing today, Malaysia seems to be stuck in a whirlwind of hate speeches and fake news fueled by worsening racial relations which both sides of the political divide are responsible for. People used to say it takes two to tango or it takes two hands to clap. And somebody told me if you say clap, you better make sure you clap it. So this is reality in the country. So ladies and gentlemen, the question is, but who must lead the solution? Who must take charge and realize we need to fix this before it gets worse? But we have to accept that. This is really happening in our country. That's the reason why Malaysia has a position of a minister called Minister of Unity. We are not trying to point fingers at anyone, but this is the responsibility of a leader. A leader, the job of a leader is to take, to take care of the people whom they are taking charge of. A leader is not there to be in charge. So therefore, there is reason for Malaysia to have a position of a minister of unity.
Now, what has the government done till today? We want to see this happening. It seems that politics today is all about lashing out. People starting to point finger at each other. What have you in BND? You know, which will seem like the easiest option. Good sense and sincerity must prevail in wanting to see Malaysia move forward, and I don't see that in the current government. Well, because we are asked to mention about the post GE14, so I mentioned the current government, which is not new anymore. So, is anyone taking leadership and healing those races who are hurt? So, who are hurt? If you listen to um, some of the presenters, just now talking about Bumi Putra. Bumi Putra may think that they are also hurt, and the non-Bumi Putras also think seeing that. The government is not doing enough for them. But what are we going to do about it? Somebody has to take charge and do something about it. So ladies and gentlemen, now, nowadays, when, you know, every time when we read, uh, we, see, we, we, we look into the social media, we look into cases like um, what is happening to the Adib case and the recent one, we saw uh, the Tang Long case. Actually, the Tang Long it was, to me, it should not be a case at all. But why did it happen until seven ministers came, including the Deputy Prime Minister? When we were small, Tang Long is something that we were always looking forward to. And we were all carrying the Tang Longs, and there was never an issue. But why is this happening now? So, we talk a lot about unity. Actually, when I saw the word unity, it reminds me when I first learned about politics or when I attended functions, I saw excerpts of speeches by the previous chief ministers, the previous prime ministers. They always talk about per paduan or unity. That is the key word. So ladies and gentlemen, we, we want to see People not just talking about unity, but ministers or politicians for that matter, they want to gain support from their own race, and then they must raise this issue in the government. So the government must, must make sure that they tackle this. The economy, for example, has also taken a hit due to this political uncertainty following the aftermath of the 14th GE. Commodity prices are falling, unemployment rate is on the rise, and people are not feeling the boost in their wallets that they were hoping for. We must also not discount the risks involving security surrounding the country, with unwanted forces potentially exploiting our divided society, threats to national unity, combined with a flagging economy, and security threats serve a potent and dangerous mix for Malaysia's future. So ladies and gentlemen, since the first bell had rung, I'd like to conclude. But before I conclude, I'd like to bring you all back to when Dato Lee Chong Wei, as a representative for Malaysia, who played against Lindan. You remember who the coach was? It was Miss Bun Siddiq. And here we're talking about race. Miss Boon being a Malay. Chong Wei being a Chinese. And when Chong Wei won, Chong, we saw on TV, Chong Wei and Miss Boon Siddiq hugged each other. Did you all ever realize that? How many tears were shedding on that night? People shed tears because they were happy that Chong Wei won. People shed tears because you could see a Malay and a Chinese working together to make sure that Malaysia won. You made a name for Malaysia. You placed Malaysia on the world record. And people were very happy that this is a symbol of unity. So ladies and gentlemen, what Malaysia needs most at this point of time are ethnic bridge builders instead of ethnic heroes to neutralize the politics of hatred. Racial polarization and racial exclusiveness 
which seems to be on the rise now. We need to remember that tolerance and respect among the ethnic groups as outlined in the federal constitution and Rukun Negara are key to the peace and harmony in a multiracial and religious country like Malaysia. I wish I could share with you more, but um, this is what I can share with you for the, for the time being. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, uh, YB, for that presentation. I think YB highlighted that she takes a very professional and responsible stand in her commitment um, in nation building and her commitment to see Malaysia successful. She has rightly pinpointed, I think overlapping some of the points, Maria Chin from a different political party highlighting over the issues of race, racial politics, the politics of hatred, uh, and highlighting uh, the failure of political leadership uh, to address this. And I think these are serious points to look at um, if a cabinet reshuffle is to take place and things of this sort uh, for PH to take into account that uh, what is being said uh, as sentiments. Eh? So thank you, YB. Now we move on to YB Senator Datusri T. Lianke. Uh, he too is no stranger in the political scene, a vice president of MCA, a chairman of INSAF, the Institute of Strategic Analysis and Policies. I think his CV goes on, a lawyer by training, um, constantly willing to come to all kinds of discussions uh, to make his stance and views. Um, I think you're the only Barisan National. If MCA is still part of Barisan National, I think it is. So uh, let's give a hand to Datus, the Senator. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak here and stand here. I'll quickly run through what I've prepared. The topic today actually take more than 15 minutes for every heading, but I'll quickly go through. There was an euphoria of sort after G14. As it is the first time in Malaysian history we changed the government. Confidence in the government have sought and expectation of a new Malaysia was at the highest in May 2018, immediately after the change. However, the optimism did not last long. Three months onwards, there was a drastic drop in confidence. By June 2019, the public's overall satisfaction rating towards Pakatan Harapan had fallen to less than 50%. The overview of Pakatan Harapan, it is the promises made by the Pakatan Harapan that the people have high expectations. Their campaign manifesto includes strong commitments to repeal Raconian legislation, reform public institutions, and rectify human rights. However, nearly two years that, uh, uh, post G14, the government is struggling not only to meet their promises, but also perpetuated practices of the old that's unwanted by the people. Stagnant wages, rising cost of living, and poor performing economy have diminished the expectations of the people. Not uh, only they are not seeing reform coming forth, but they have seen worse in the pipeline. Prior to the 14th general election, the Pakatan Harapan Coalition came up with a manifesto, which they later admitted was made purely to fish votes. Upon coming to power, instead of governing seriously, instead of concentrating on fulfilling their promises, they continue to play the victim role and cry foul when things are not going their way. Either they blame the previous government or a deep state indeed. They hit out at the previous government continuously, not realizing that people have expectations of the new government. And they have no interest to see their pop, uh, victim playing role or the political, uh, pl uh, uh, politi uh, political pl continuous political play. PH government and the new Malaysia fail badly. And even their supporters are disappointed and disillusioned. 
In less than two years, the people have not seen any positive changes. Instead, they were subject to disappointment after disappointment, one after another, as the Pakatan Harapan not only turn their backs on promises, make changes that they promised to the people, but they also return to old ways and worse. PH coalition only managed to recycle and repackage plenty of the previous government's idea to be presented as their own. It is upsetting for the people to realize that the Pakatan Harapan government did not plan to carry out their promises in the first place and that they have cheated, they feel cheated that these plans and reform was not in the pipeline and there is no political view to do so. Coming back to Share Prosperity Vision 2030. The Share Prosperity Vision 2020 introduced last year claims to address wealth and income disparities. While the concept is noble, it did nothing to dismantle any race-based policies. The, the emphasis on the increasing the income of all ethnic groups is particularly Bumiputra. And this is no difference from new economic policy when we talk of restructuring, but the emphasis again was on in Bumiputra. So we are actually reinventing new economic policy under the name of shared prosperity. And MCA took the bull by the horn in, when, when new economic policy was expiring in 1990. When Tun Daim announced in Singapore, despite repeated, repeatedly MCA asked, is the new economic policy going to be extended? When PAS and AMNO Youth was pressuring the government to increase the Bumiputra equity from 30% to 51%, Tun Ling then took an unpaid leave for six years in silent protest, in a very subtle way that we do not agree to any extension. And that's when the new economic consultative council was formed, huh? whereby 75, 75 Bumiputra and 75 non Bumiputra, including Lim Kik Siang, DAP, and Tong Chao Chung, etc., came together to talk about the way forward. You talk about development. That's why the new economic policy from risk uh, base was changed to development base. Unfortunately, the bureaucrats, the culture of the new economic policy, the, the, the emphasis on Bumiputra continued to remain, but MCA was blamed despite we changed the policy and our president put his head on the chopping block. Coming back to the new economic policy, the shared prosperity today is governed by the Ministry of Economics, which is actually a power taken away from the finance minister to be focused on a Malay-centric uh, sort of policy. The first thing he does is to have a convention. For the first time, a ministry have a convention to, to talk about the economic, a uh, booming put drug economic con convention, etc. Race-based. This is totally uncalled for and not what New Malaysia is all about. It is precisely this kind of policy that was heavily criticised by Pakatan before they came into power. Especially we see DAP in their Stabat Declaration. They say that the parties will, not, will do away with Bumit Putra, focus on process of nation building, and insist on a level playing field, ethnic equality is of paramount importance, etc. And it is upon that principle that they insist MCA has failed. But unfortunately today, we are bringing back what MCA has changed from new economic policy to new development policy. I remember very clearly, 1995 was the first time state assemblyman at a very young age of 32 years old. Tun Khalil then was my Menteri Besar. He told the SEDC, etc. Today, we are talking about development. There is no focus on Bumi Putra. We talk about development and I hope all the SEDC executive will respect this new policy. That, I was very impressed with that. Unfortunately, we cannot deny the culture of the Bumi Putra emphasis remains and it was unable to be changed. Just like America, they claim oh, everybody is equal, but they continually discriminate the, the blacks, etc., the colored people. So coming back to the GSD and SST, other Pakatan Harapan has also promised to combat rising cost of living, which they blame it on GST. They claimed that GST had escalated living costs and pledged to replace it with SST. Thus, GST was zero rated, was, and, but an SST was introduced after three months. During that period, prices dropped, but it quickly regained ground. Thus, it was proven that the SST is an inferior tax uh, system 
and, and, and as, as the GST is actually many people regretted. And they say whatever Pakatan has done, they should not have done away with the GST because it's a better tax system. This is an afterthought. On the government of GLCs, the coalition had also promised to make the governance of government linked companies on par with international standards. But the view to do so is very, very low. Despite continuously stating that the government will be free of politicians and will not be interfere in business, there are no strategies, no plans to reduce the influences of government and uh, political personalities in GF, GLCs and the economy. As to GLCs being freed of political influences, the Prime Minister continued to be the chairman of Kazana, which was supposedly to be all Malaysians, but subsequently he has a political narrative that this is for Bumiputra, despite being denied or being challenged or questioned by the past uh, CEO, etc. And politically connected figures remain in senior positions of various CLC, GLCs. To change the status quo would require tremendous effort by the government. And we need people like Maria Abdullah, not only to protest, but to take a stand to be an independent member of parliament as a matter of protest, if, they, if she is so fundamentally strong in her principles. If our new Malaysia and, new and old Malaysia, with two years in the government, the term new Malaysia is still ambiguous. The question remains, what is New Malaysia? What are the changes people can expect from New Malaysia? It would be exciting if Pakatan Harapan had repealed repressive laws or come up with a solid economic policy to boost the nation's economy or build Malaysia's identity on an international platform. Unfortunately, these are met with a lack of enthusiasm and the Pakatan Harapan government backtracked on its decision to rectify ISERT Rome, Rome is a, uh, Statute of International Criminal Court, etc. The cost and living and minimum wage. Another problem, uh, a pressing problem is the soaring cost of living and failure to produce more jobs in the market. Public sentiments are generally about wage stagnation, jobs instability and rising cost of living. These are crucial problems that the Ministry of Economic Affairs has yet to come up with a policy to increase economic activity within the country. I think he's too busy fighting within the party. Take for example, the government's decision to ask companies to implement minimum wage in 2020 in December 2019. With less than two weeks to make preparations, companies that already suffered from sluggish economy performance will have to factor in on minimum wage for their employees. The decision will equally have an impact on employees and the market as well. Though at first glance, the employees seem to be benefiting directly. Companies might be forced to lay off some employees to accommodate remaining staff. The MEF has already cautioned against the poor timing of the minimum wage where possible counterproductive measures will be a hike in prices or to lay off employees. The Pakatan government promised in their manifesto that they will share 50% of the cost increase for setting higher minimum wage. It would be prudent to ask the government to reflect upon the current situation and map out a detailed plan for smooth transition. I would like to focus, since my bell ring, I will just jump to this, uh, what we are more interested Time's in. Up, Time's up. Oh, sorry. It's red. Oh, just give me two sentences on this UMNO and past declaration. I think many of us fear this UMNO and past. But in MCA, as usual, we always, uh, and I'm one of the very strong proponents I believe in engagement. I think there should not be any taboo. I think when Sungai Besar by election, nobody dares to stand with, uh, in, stand up and talk. I go and speak and say, we insist that past and UMNO must respect the constitution, must talk on universal values, we must talk of the national agenda, etc. And I think this Muafakat National is basically about consensus building. It's about respecting new, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the new Malaysia. And I've seen Ustaz Haji change in his political narrative. Do those days about kafir, uh, non-Muslims, exclude, uh, excluding them, now they are more inclusive. And I think it is this step that has to be taken. I, I for one, MCA do not agree to work with PAS, but I strongly advocated we have to work with the most extreme people to make them moderate. And that I have happy to note that this, we are making changes. Uh, and we do not, we do, it does not mean that when we work with the enemy, we are joining the enemy. So with that, uh, once again, I, I hope to have more questions on the floor. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, um, Datu Sri, for your uh, reflections. I think you have raised uh, critical questions. For a minute, I was wondering whether you were a PH sympathizer, uh, hoping that all the manifesto would actually have been executed. Uh, but I, I know you were critically pointing out uh, the shortcomings and failures. Uh, but I, I think in the course of this discussion, we can find out what specifically are MCA's positions uh, within the BN Abno Pass coalition uh, that addresses some of these concerns that are completely against the ethos of PAS uh, or Amno. Uh, and I think that's something if others want to raise uh, uh, would be. But many of your points sounded very similar to Maria Chin uh, in her lament over the failure of the um, uh, reform agenda. Our third speaker is um, well known in politics, um, controversial, a uh, fourth, uh, controversial in politics as well. Um, I'm not sure what his political affiliations are at this moment, but um, I, I mean, Tinchua is a friend, a former YB, uh, vice president of uh, PKR and chairman of the Malaysian Pro Productivity Corporation. Over to you, sir. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, our, uh, Chairperson. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all the VIPs, fellow speakers, uh, very good. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, when I agree to talk, I would prefer uh, Tan Sri my girl gave me a role to talk about the future of economy, and, uh, but so I'm stuck with the topic of uh, politics, so I will stick to that. I will skip uh, all the economics uh, thing, and I also don't want to repeat the criticisms and the, the points that have been raised, and I have no uh, reason to disagree with any other previous uh, speakers. I would just like to start uh, with what um, the public hoped to see after 2018. And uh, most of us who voted in the elections expect that a genie will come out from the lamp and uh, the genie will answer to all our wishes and then things uh, turn better. That was the enthusiasm for the first six months. But actually, it's, there was no genie coming out from the, the lamp. And instead, I want to use another nursery rhyme to describe the situation. It is about Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's men and all the king horses couldn't put Humpty Dumpty's back together again. Exactly this is what happened to our nations. What happened in 2018? There's a coalition of all forces come together with only one objective, to change the government. And it is the aspiration for many of us to see the change. Many people who want to change because they disagree with Najib, one MDB and other things. Some people vote because they don't like Amno. Some people voted because they don't want to see Barisan National continue. Some people voted because they don't like corrup corruption, something that cost of living is uh, unbearable and they are okay with the corruption. Some people think the economy is the issues, need to have more liberal, more rational uh, management. And some think the, the racial hegemony must change. There are various ideas that we all come together. So there was no central theme that we come together. Why the change? And the change happened. And I just would like to say that despite the change, which is Baisan National Amno Monopoly of Powers has been dismantled. But what if we see clearly the results, which I sit back during the time of counting the votes, 
I already said, actually, there's not much change. Why is it not much change? Since independent, we see the, the central of political power as, has always been in the west coast of Semanjung, Malaysia. And the real change did happen in 2008 in the west coast of Semanjung, Malaysia. The east coast, since independent, and it's not, was not comfortable with this concept of Malaysia. Kelantan went to courts asking to leave Malaysia. These two states did not join the change. They stay with us. And we see there was change in Borneo states. We gained a few big seats, a lot of seats, and uh, we defeated the ruling party in some of the area which is stronghold. But eventually, you see Sabah Sarawak is led by two local parties that uh, value autonomy more than uh, the whole national ethos. We have to recognize that. So the change, it is not a universal upheaval that everyone wants reformacy, everyone support PH. It is very much the landscape we had since the foundation of this nation. So I think Pakatan Harapan did not, or the public that has been very vocal in social media had not paid enough attention to this change which reaffirmed the differences that we have since the foundation of this nation. So what is, what it is actually we have seen is a central power that used to control everything, that keep all these things under the carpet, now open up. So people feel that there's a lot more polarization. But to me, it was just a volcano that just being exploded, all the lavas underneath coming out. So we have to, we have to accept that. When people ask, what do we expect next? I would say there will be, no, be noise. Democratic democracy is a noisy business. And what to expect in the future? There will be more noise. There will be more noises. There will be no more disagreement. There will be more argument, more debates. Because now disagreement comes very cheap. To disagree with the prime ministers or ministers of the central government has very little risk nowadays. So the, the debate will continue. The disagreement will continue. And the, until we started to recognize the differences and started to find consensus, the new consensus. I have a lot of points I want to raise in terms of exact uh, example, but I think I don't have time for that. And issues that some people were disappointed, like ISIS, like I, some of the ILO conventions, issues of death penalties, issue of IPCMC. Yes, I agree. I think government has, um, some people can say there's not strong, enough strong will. But they also have to, we also have to recognize that people keep calling us to listen to the public. We lost five by election continuously. People say, you must listen to the public. We lost to who? We lost to people who disagree with our reform, who disagree with the value that we're trying to put forward. And that shows how strong is the resistance. We could come to power and only accommodate or accountable to our own supporters and bulldoze whatever people who disagree. But we also understand that Currently, the central governments do not have such power to Buddhos. It is something that we have to live with the realities of differences, the realities of noises. So I, I would like to make some... Uh, okay, uh, I would also like to, to follow up with what uh, Dr. T. Lenker said. Um, the challenges of past and unknown. Yes, there's going to be something that we have to face. There's certain party that espouse a value that we disagree, 
But I also somehow agree with uh, Dato T that the engagement is inevitable. We have to accept that they are part of the landscape in Malaysian politics. So, to, to sum up, what do we expect from the future? I think first, PH has to complete our mandates with whatever we promise and we have to try to implement or we have to try to put the framework. As we said before, at least those issues like ISIS, death penalties and all these things which has been not touched at all by previous government, now is open up. And let's the Pandora box open out and let those people who feel passionate about use this space to campaign until the majority agree with us that these are the good things for the future. So in that sense that we also will see, and that's part of the noise, noisiness that will come out, is that the blurring of the line between ruling parties and oppositions. We are sitting here, none of us are from opposition because we are either state government or we are federal governments. And there will be blurring line between oppositions and, and governments. That means that all, all of us have a responsibility to governance and all of us have a responsibility to be critical because in the nature of politics, we are competing against each other. Even within the political party, we are competing against each other. That's a reality in any democracy. If people think that Malaysia is not stable, let's go and look at Australia. Let's go and look at Britain now. Let's look at America at the moment. And that's the realities that all democracy has to face. Lastly, we also have to, to see that the reforms need consensus. And that also require the PH government to be more consultative, not only with the public, but also with our oppositions. And they, they must be before the end of our terms and also towards the next election. There must be new consensus. There must be new alignment and it must be oriented to policies and principles of the nation building. So uh, with that, I think my time's up. I would like, I think some part of this, we can leave it to uh, discussions. And I would like to again invite the public to look at this objectively. What we see now is a space that opened up for all of us. And we don't expect the change to be institutionalized in such a short time, but we expect debates to be more intense and to hope for a stable, a stable racially harmonized society, we can have a situation like we have a strong centralized control where everyone has to force to love each other and not to talk about racist things, which we have seen in Yugoslavia. Or we can have a multiracial melting pot Pot that which is very noisy and people disagree with each other and sometimes side by side with the ugly racisms in the society because of the freedoms that those societies have cherished. So we see in India and China and in, in uh, uh, United States where we always have to confront with the ugly aspect of the societies and allow the society to handle it and not just the legal framework or the political parties. So this is the choice. And we want to, if we want to see stability, peaceful and racial harmony, the only hope is the political process will produce enlightened publics. And the, only the enlightened public is the guardians for a stable democratic society. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Tinchua for Saudara Tinchua for those thoughts and reflections. I'm a bit surprised with your presentation, but I leave the panelists to, I mean, other panelists to comment and from the floor. I'm surprised that you really downplayed the change that took place. Uh, two points were raised, one by YB Maria Chin on the failure of communication 
strategy on the pH side uh, to inform the public adequately of the changes or no changes. And why be Nancy Shukri raised the failure of political leadership to manage some of these things. Um, and, and it's not just um, a rhetoric, uh, because I have been on these panels for such a long time that you suddenly sounded to me like a BN minister uh, in, in the panel uh, on what, what uh, academics will call authority-defined statements and, um, and, and so forth. So I do not, I mean, I, okay. But uh, I'm just saying I wanted to spice up the lunchtime Q&A afterwards. Now, the only panelist today uh, who I think is non-politician, uh, because the CV doesn't provide that, but he's a journalist. And, and possibly as the last speaker and a journalist over 20 years uh, and being in media and communications, he might bring a fresh outlook to us. So you've got so many different politicians saying things, some of which sounding the same. But there is a definite affirmation of PH's failure. We have heard very little of the way forward in the next two or three years in terms of clear political commitment uh, for change, either coming from uh, either speakers. Uh, but maybe you will bring. So let me hand over the time and let's give a hand to Inche uh, Jamari Mokta uh, at this point. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Well, I'm the most uh, lightweight and unknown among the heavyweight analyst members. And I'm not supposed to be here actually, but because uh, my CEO, CEO of MA Research, Dr. Rais Hussein, he couldn't attend because he's performing the Umrah. So he sent his salam and regards to all of you. And so here I am, taking his place. Okay, the, the topic today. Uh, as you all know, this May, it will be exactly uh, two, two years of Pakatan Harapan helming the country. So I will follow closely the guideline given to me. So after two years, what's next? Okay, I think there are four important issues that, Pak that Pakatan has to grapple with starting from now. And these issues are, number one, the succession issue. Number two, what I call the Perut economy issue or the Tami issue or the bread and butter issue. Number three is manifesto fulfillment. And finally, the shared prosperity vision 2030. But the last part I'm not going to touch because I think Professor Terence Gomez has given quite a good and excellent analysis of the issue. So, succession issue. This is a very important issue. Uncertainty over the issue may just cause some instability to the economy. Foreign investors and fund managers are taking a wait-and-see attitude before committing their investment of funds into Malaysia. They want to see certainty on the succession issue resolved first. Like last year, performance of the stock exchange and the depreciation of the ringgit throughout 2019 can be primarily attributed to this issue which affects the net inflow of funds into Malaysia. Therefore, there's a there is an utmost urgency that the succession issue be resolved before things get worse. Now, it's very difficult to anticipate what to expect because of the unpredictability of the situation and the strong personalities involved. But uh, I think there are three possible scenarios. Number one, the succession issue will take place in May. Number two, the succession issue will take place in December after the APEC meeting in November. And finally, 
PM Tun Mahathir, will continue to helm the country until GE15. These are all the three possibilities. In my opinion, as long as any one of these scenarios take place with a full agreement and concurrence of both Tun Mahathir and Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, there is no uncertainty, which in turn means there won't be any instability. What is important is for this agreement by both gentlemen to be made public, to be announced as soon as possible so that we can nip in the bud the uncertainty and the instability that it may engender. Okay, now I move to the broad economy issue. This issue has been found to be the issues that have kept the rakyat worried and indirectly may affect their level of satisfaction towards the government. And when their level of satisfaction is affected, that means it's going down, regime change is in the offing. So from our inaugural poll, which Emma Research did late last year, we found that the five major issues which top the worry list of the rakyat are First, mitigating cost of living. Second, enhancing the standard of living. C, creating credible jobs. Fourth, ensuring affordable homes. And last, enabling affordable health care. So if these five issues is taken care of, what we call the government satisfaction index will, will, will be in favor of Pakatan Harapan. Now, these five issues have contributed to Malaysia having a national worry index of 0 0.77, which denotes a marginally maximum worry rakyat. These five issues can be addressed if the government focuses their attention rigorously on fulfilling all the promises contained in its manifesto during GE14. This is because all these manifesto promises are geared towards addressing the bread and butter issues. Okay, now uh, I move to manifesto fulfillment. In the same poll that we had conducted, the slow pace of manifesto fulfillment had contributed towards a government satisfaction index of 0 0.53, which denote an average satisfaction towards the government. Now, in the present quarter, January to March, we'll be conducting another poll, and hopefully these indices will get better. Once it gets better, it will result in the stability of the country, it will result in the prosperity of the country, and hopefully everything goes well. Okay, now from... Okay, from, from what's next and what to expect, where do, you, where do we go from, from here? I mean, for the, success, for the succession issue, as I said, this has to be resolved quickly in order to reassure, to reassure the market so that all the funds needed for achieving SPV or uh, Shared Professor Revision 2030 can come into Malaysia fast and furious. The key is to nip uncertainty in the bud. It doesn't really matter whether the, the succession will take place in May or December or after GE15. What matters is the scenario decided and agreed upon by Tun Mahathir and Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim must be quickly made known to the public so as to quell the uncertainty. Now, for the Perot economy issue or the Tami economy issue, Pakatan needs to start focusing on delivering its promises as contained in the manifesto. It must also do it fast and furious because time is running short. There are only three years uh, to GE15. First, what we are suggesting is that Pakatan will have to map out the deliverables against the ministry and make it a KPI, key personal indicator, performance indicator of each of the ministry. And then, yes, policies and their KPIs do take time to bear results. But if these are implemented now, there will be three years to G15 for this to benefit and, and, and 
three years can also be a relatively longer time. Therefore, there's time to do this, to, to implement the, the part of the manifesto that has not been fulfilled. Perhaps start with promising or with the promises that may not have caused consideration. People are really hoping to see monumental change. As for SPV, there is uh, one thing that I would like to touch. You see, uh, you need to address the SPV, you need to address and focus on solution for what appears to be the underlying structural and macroeconomic imbalances that have in inhibited the economy to perform efficiently. Example in agriculture, why is that when there is an increased demand for local produce, there is no corresponding increase in the supply to meet the increased demand? There must be some underlying structural and macroeconomic imbalance, imbalance for this state of affair. So the SPV must get to the bottom of this issue. Then similar, similarly, when the SPV aims at increasing the employer share of GDP from 36 to 48 percent, so as to be roughly what it is in Singapore, which is 39.7 percent, South Korea 45.7 percent, and Germany 51.5 percent, it must realize that for Malaysia to achieve target of 48 percent would require the country to shed its reliance on commodities and low technology. However, currently, high technology is adopted only by 37% of the manufacturing sector and 20% of the services sector. Why is this so? Is there some structural and macroeconomic imbalances responsible for this state of affair? The SPV should go deeper into this. I think with that, I end uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, um, Jamari Mokta. I think you have uh, move the discussion from just analysis of the past and failures and justifications to the way ahead, succession issue, economy, uh, the manifesto, fulfillment, and the critical aspects of the shared prosperity vision. I think these are fundamental, uh, and I think um, the q and I think we have about 10 minutes or so uh, till uh, lunchtime or or so to take it up. Maybe if you identified yourself, your name, the question, we could take three to five questions. Yes, please. Uh, the mic. Uh, yes. Yeah, state your name and yeah. Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Adriana Abu. I'm, for today, I'm representing the National House Buyers Association. Um, what I gather from all the five speakers okay. is the focus is on policy. So I don't really have a question, just um, some suggestions as a concerned citizen. Uh, three things, basically. So I would like to suggest that if you're looking at policies, it's for the benefit of the Malaysian citizens, the Rakyat, not just how to encourage uh, profit-making. It shouldn't be money-based policies per se. Um, I'm saying this because in my work with the HBA, we have some engagements with the federal government. This is on house bias issue, housing matters. So we have actually proposed throughout the years, HBA, suggestions, proposals, how to um, tackle the, the problems facing the housing, especially for the buyers. But what we notice is the response is previous government, even current government, the focus is still on profit making. So maybe perhaps we need to balance with the consumers, not just the ones making money out of certain industries. Secondly, your policies... I think you need to, because in, in, in due time... Uh, yeah. Maybe just post a yes. question or one yes. comment. All right. You won't okay. have the time right. to... Secondly, um, clear and direct policies. Um, make sure that whatever is written in black and white is certain. There's no uh, open-ended um, choices being given. Because especially if you want to invite foreign direct investments, they need something which is clear before they put in the money. If you give too many ambiguity there, then, then there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, uh, non-confidence to come here. Um, thirdly, also your stakeholder, your public engagement, I would like to suggest that it's uh, not just for lip service. You actually do give certain time to invite the stakeholders of the public to consider or to argue, trash out your policies. And please, if you can, 
really take the suggestions coming out from the people who are impacted sincerely. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes. yes. I have a question. Uh, um, name and... Yeah. Uh, my name is Karim. Uh, my question is directed for uh, Yang Bahomat, uh, Senator Datuk T. Uh, uh, just now you mentioned that uh, uh, on MCA's cooperation with, uh, with PAS, I'd like to know more about that because this is not the first time that we have a Chinese-dominated party working with the Islamist uh, uh, party. Um, in the general election, GE13, we saw PAS and DAP working together, um, and that was generally well accepted by the community. What, uh, uh, but however, in the current scenario, we don't see the same level of support. What do you think is the difference between uh, these two scenarios between this time around and what happened in the previous uh, general election. And um, what do you think is MCA's position uh, when there are uh, events such as uh, uh, the Islamist Party's uh, proposal to limit personal freedoms, such as the recent criticism of uh, guaranteeing the freedom of religion, uh, the criticism of the G25 when they mentioned about the freedom to choose your religion. So I'd like to ask you about what, what is MCA's position in that? And as a democratic liberal Malay man, it actually is of something of great concern to me as a citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Specific question. Any other? Yes, please. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to also ask uh, this uh, Senator T, because he did mention that uh, he would work with, uh, or MCA would work with the with the most extreme or extreme, but uh, in, by your logic, um, will MCA work with the uh, Taliban or ISIS in order to survive and thrive the political scene in Malaysia? Because it, it seems to be in that direction. Um, the second question is uh, uh, Wabi Maria in the beginning, she said uh, something about the IPMCC. Um, uh, Senator Wabi Maria and also uh, Wabi Tian Chua and myself uh, has um, had some experience being incarcerated um, and when you are incarcerated in Malaysia then you will know what, what is the, um, the rotten um, system that has been gone for more than six decades um, so for, uh, for, for the information in the floor uh, there were a lot of corruptions, and even the police are selling drugs to the detainees, and and the, the prisoners and the detainees in prison and in the lockup, it is a, it is a haven for them, and um, I, I don't see anyone is speaking about it as I'm, I'm a normal Malaysian citizen. Perhaps you have the, the platform, the the power, and the position. Perhaps you could do something about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh Anyone else? Yes, at the back there. Anyone else interested? Please show your hand or come to the mic. Yeah. Hi, my name is Chloe. Um, this is a question directed at Mr. Tianzhua because he talks about opening space. So as a young voter, I advocate for freedom of expression, and I do welcome that in a sense that I think moderation and civility should be practiced in difficult conversations. But um, a seizing from ISA sort of doesn't match with that, uh, that, that sentiment. The decision to, dis to a seat from ISA is fine, that's your decision to make. But I'm curious to know how does the government plans to move forward from that? Since we're opening up space and we're seeding from ISA, d does the government have a new sort of direction that protects all voices so that hate speech doesn't fester and then oppress or threatens the existence of it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, uh, shall I ask the uh, 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 Senator to respond and then to Maria and then a final word from all the panelists? Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure what the timing is. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Ka Karim just now mentioned that why is it that the Chinese are so receptive uh, in G13, G14, even G12 and DAP work with uh, past? There was no this taboo, there was no this fear or phobia. 
precisely, it is all about political narrative, trust, feelings, confidence. Basically, by and large, the Chinese believe in DAP because DAP has been playing the, the, the noble role of uh, the political narrative of higher moral ground. But once they come into power, it's a blessing in disguise. People start seeing them for what they are, actually. And MCA has consistently warned about empowering past. Because we know past DNA, political DNA. We know past political culture. But that does not mean that the leaders in past are all extreme. The leaders in past are all Taliban. Similarly, when we work with UMNO, there's a lot of extremists in UMNO. Huh? And some of them are now in Bersatu. And many of them are actually in Bersatu. So, but we know and we recognize to what extent we can engage. And we know where is the bottom line. So MCA has never compromised or run away. In fact, Lim Kik Siang and Tung Chao Chung was the one who ran away from New Economic Policy Consultative Council when there was a, cons a, a consultative approach. And MCA was forced to take the bull by the horn by asking then the late Tan Sri Ghazali Shafi that we can continue the forum provided there is no voting because we are outnumbered. So coming back to working with PAS, uh, we must understand that PAS is emerging as a powerful political party. The Islamic political sentiment is getting stronger. Even I discovered my own staff, when I went to go to join PAS, Mutama, etc., my own staff are holding party position in PAS. And you can see that the Malay basically trust PAS. If you can see today, a lot of this civil movement, you cannot engage the other side of the Malays. What you are getting are thinking, rational, scientific, logical Malays. The moderate Malays, or it's so-called the liberal Malays. So basically, who is going to play the role of the devil? Who is going to be the unpopular figure? I am very unpopular. When I stood with PAS, when I worked with PAS, when, because Takirin Hassan, the Secretary General, happens to be the president of AMSU, University of Malaya Student Union, during my student day, and I was the Secretary General. So I know to what extent they are extreme, to what extent we can engage. So engagement is part and parcel. We are not an appetite country. So that is the problem. A lot of us think that we are only living in Klang Valley. A lot of us thinking that we are having control of the political uh, environment. But Thank the you. ecosystem is totally different. We need engagement. And uh, it is time, it is, it is a real situation. PAS will emerge ruling our country one day. And we have to empower the moderate Malays in PAS. We have to educate them. We cannot abandon them. Thank you. Thank you. It could be another day for another discussion whether pass of uh, 2008 and 13 is the same pass at uh, 2018 or not. But we leave that. Why be Maria to you? There was a specific question. Yeah. IPCMC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is actually uh, the need for IPCMC, right? Uh, well, we definitely need the IPCMC, but uh, because uh, IPCMC was actually set up, if I'm not mistaken, under uh, Abdullah Badawi's time, and it was uh, fully supported by the Bar Council. Mainly is to um, manage yeah, um, the police force, as well as to make it much more professional. So then we will get rid of um, uh, abuse of power. We will also have a system whereby the police can actually have uh, space to actually complain, to make complaints as well. So um, it's a much more comprehensive uh, approach to how we can actually um, strengthen the PDRM. That's the intention. But when it was actually introduced in Parliament, there was a lot of rejection um, and objection. So now we have actually gone to the select committee to review, and um, the select committee has gone around the country to um, get the opinions, and uh, we are going to bring it back again to Parliament for discussion. But um, IPCMC is just the structural uh, reform for the PDRM. The other part of the uh, reform that we want to also see is the welfare of the police. That has to be taken off. Even um, whatever we feel about uh, detainees, uh, death in custody and all that, but also we also have to also look at the welfare of the law enforce enforcement team. So um, uh, I think that the, this year's uh, budget, uh, quite a lot of money has been allocated to actually uh, review the uh, welfare of the police. So 
we are hoping that this will actually move on. But uh, what I worry is that uh, we may not even get the IPCMC um, even established this time around because of the objection and um, it being seen as a racial issue, anti-police. Um, so we have a lot of uh, obstacles on this and we really hope that the public will actually give the support to have the IPCMC as well as build the welfare of the police. Thank you. We have uh, two other general questions that were raised. One on a policy making process and stakeholder engagement. And the second one is on the open space, moderating, moderating hate speech and so forth. I'm just asking the three other panelists to make a very brief, because the, the VIP for the lunch is here, but a minute or so for each of the speakers to wind up. Over to you. Dr. Well, thank you. I think um, the, the matter that had been raised regarding policy, yeah, I, I agree with you. It has to be very um, inclusive. We have to be very inclusive, taking, care, taking into account the needs base, especially the B40. What are we doing about the housing problems? So as policymakers, it has to be an inclusive inclusive policy. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier on unity just now, in Sarawak we have this unit called Unifor, unit for other religion, so that the other religions would feel that they are not being left out uh, in terms of their um, religious needs, in terms of activities, the churches, the temples. So we are tackling that as well. So we have already um, established unit for other religion apart from the Islamic religious uh, uh, unit in, in Sarawak. So this is how one of the ways that we, we structure our reform in order to make sure that everybody is um, included in the policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tintua, if you want to make a... Okay. Um, yeah. Um, just very general. First, uh, on the issues about moderations and digital in the digital communications. Um, as I said, this, uh, the Humpty Dumpty is already broken, so it's very difficult for us to put it back because the fear of spread, sending out fake news is no longer there. And I think we have to live with that. We have to live with a situation that uh, there will be a lot of this type of communication and uh, I mean, as large as I like those people who spread fake news about Pakatan to be jailed, but it's not going to be possible. We have uh, removed the anti-fake news uh, law. And um, at the end, the guardians has to be coming from the public. And I believe that uh, it is the process that we have to go through. And it is something that we all have to play a role in, in responsible for it. And that's partly uh, some of the reforms that we bring, uh, like cell regulation through the media council and things like that. Um, in terms of policy, that's the inclusiveness will always take time. And that's also it become a paradox that a lot of people criticise us for no longer so efficient. A lot of uh, uh, lawmaking and regulations uh, is much slower nowadays, and uh, while publics also com sometimes complain that delivering is uh, slow, but at the same time, uh, the businesses also say that decisions are slow. Well, I, I would like to say that currently uh, in the organization, in PEM PCs, and it will be extended to parliament, we are trying to push for this good regulatory practice, uh, GRP or RIA. Uh, in ensuring that every policy change must exhaust all the stakeholders' input. And that, again, we have to anticipate there will be more discussion and uh, taking a slower process. But again, this is part of the future of democracy that we have to live with. Um, that's what I would Thank say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Saudara. Yes, over to last speaker. Well, I think uh, policy must not only be uh, inclusive, it must also be actionable policy. And this means policy recommendations must be evidence-based and data-driven. 
So, when policies are empirically proven, <coughs> it will be easier to get the buy-in from policy makers in implementing it, and ultimately from the rakyat. Because uh, policy based on evidence are grounded in the experience of the rakyat. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I think we have come to the end of this discussion. I'm sure the issues raised today, for example, issues, the analysis, the next agenda, is something that's not going to end here. I'm sure over lunch and other times you would be interacting on these key themes. I think what's emerging is the need for very strong political leadership, strong political will, uh, and I hear Saudara Tinchua reminding it is the will of the people. And I, uh, on WhatsApp groups, have been getting messages from civil society that if the reform doesn't come, they will walk the street again uh, for the reform that was promised for. So with that note, folks, uh, let's break for lunch and let's give a hand to the panelists. Thank you very much.